to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ one of the most encouraging passages in Scripture is found in Acts chapter 8, verse 39. After the Ethiopian eunuch has obeyed God in baptism, the Bible says he went on his way rejoicing. Here's a man who found the joy of salvation and it filled his whole life. Friends, that ought to be the attitude and the motivation for every Christian, but today we're asking the question, what can we do to keep that attitude? What must I do to stay saved and to have that peace and that joy and that happiness that only comes from salvation? In our series of lessons, Be Faithful Unto Death, we want to point out some things today from Scripture that each child of God can do to make sure he's walking down the straight and narrow and to make sure that he's living the best life in a, sta in a safe state in God's eyes. And so today as we think about what must I do to stay saved, I believe if a person is going to stay saved, that person must realize every day that he is in a battle for his eternal soul. My friends, to be what God wants us to be, to overcome the devil, we have to realize we are fighting daily for our soul. There is an adversary. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, we are to be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Yes, we're in a battle, and yes, we have a very fearful adversary, the devil himself. Think back to the time of Job. Let this picture set in your mind of the devil and his activity against man. The devil appeared before God, and God asked him, where have you been, where have you come from? And he said, I've been going to and fro, back and forth on the earth. What was he doing? Searching for people to tempt to sin and lose their eternal soul. We are in a battle. Do you remember what Jesus said to Peter? I want you to think about how active Satan is. Listen to these words. Luke chapter 22, verse 31, Jesus said this to Peter. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But Jesus says, I've prayed for you that your faith would not falter. But look at what Satan was seeking and asking for, to sift Simon as wheat to separate the shaft from the good heads of wheat. That's the way the devil wants to do. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 through 5 teaches us that we are in a battle, not a carnal battle, not with weapons of physical warfare, but we are in a battle for our soul and we must commit every thought to Christ and live the way God wants us to. We must put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 17, Paul says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that we may resist or fight against the devil and his temptation. The Bible teaches us not to be unaware of the wiles of the devil. Friend, the devil is a wily and conniving individual. He knows my weakness and he knows your weakness and he's going to do everything possible to tempt us. And so, yes, we must realize today, as I awake, as I face life, I'm in a battle for my soul. But realize this also, here's the good news. We have been given the victory plan, and in reality, the battle has already been won. Been won. We've just got to stay on the right side. Here's the victory plan. In Revelation 12, verse 11, the Bible says, They overcame him, that is the devil, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto the death. They overcame Satan through the sacrifice of Jesus. His death defeated Satan. They overcame him by the word of their testimony. Well, what was that? That was the preaching of the gospel. That was the revelation of God's will to mankind for us. It is the scripture. How are we going to overcome the devil? By the blood of Jesus, by obeying the gospel, and by living my life according to the Bible. And notice that third one. 
And they did not love their lives unto the death. Sacrifice of Christ. The scriptures and self-sacrifice is how one overcomes the temptation. It's what we need to have to overcome the battle. The Bible says in 1 John 5 verse 4 that he who is in us, 1 John 4 verse 4, he who is in us is greater than he who is in the devil. I'm already on the winning side. God is greater than the devil, already defeated him. But this is our victory, even our faith. 1 John 5 verse 4, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. We must have faith in God and we must realize that every day we've got to commit ourselves to Jesus to live faithful and to win the battle. And so what can I do to say, stay saved? Don't take a flippant approach to life. Don't take a lackadaisical attitude to Christianity. Realize this is a serious battle. The devil's going to do everything he can today to cause me to sin. I've got to be sober, I've got to be alert, and I've got to do everything I can to win the battle with God's help. To stay saved, a person must also, more than anything else in this life, a person needs to determine to go to heaven. Friend, do you realize that going to heaven is a decision? that you make. It is a decision that you make. Oh, I understand it's by God's grace and it's by God's mercy and without that there would be no possibility of me going to heaven, but going to heaven is a decision. I've got to determine more than anything else in this life to go there. Look at the words of Paul in Philippians chapter 1 in verse 21. Why was Paul so faithful? Because he had determined more than anything else to go to heaven. Notice these words. Paul says, very simply, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul said, I want to stay here and do God's will, but more than that, I want to go and be with the Father. More than anything else, Paul had determined to go to heaven. We need to have that same attitude if we're going to stay faithful. If you will make up your mind, if you will say to yourself, more than anything else, more than riches, more than lust, more than pleasure, even more than my happiness necessarily in a physical sense, I want to go to heaven, then friend, you're well on the way to staying saved. We need to seek first the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, we need to realize that we have a home not made with hands eternal in the heavens. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 1 and 2, waiting on us. We need to realize as Jesus said to Christians, even if you're thrown in prison for a period of 10 days, you be faithful unto death and then you'll receive the crown of life. And friend, may we realize in our determination to go to heaven, that there is nothing, nothing more valuable in all the world than my soul and my desire to go to heaven. I want you to think about the rhetorical questions Jesus asked in Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. Now think seriously about these questions. Jesus says this, What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What's the most important possession you have? It's not your home, it's not your car, it's not your bank account, it's your eternal soul, and I'm encouraging you today, determined more than anything, the scripture encourages us to go to heaven. To stay saved, you also have to make the determination to live for Jesus Christ every day of your life. Friend, Christianity is not a once or twice or three time a week event. It's not like going to the dentist or going to the doctor, something you do every once in a while for a checkup. Christianity is living for Jesus every day. You've got to decide to do that if you're going to stay saved. Listen to what Jesus said. Does Jesus require that of me? Luke 9, 23, here's what Jesus said. Anybody wants to come after me? He said, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Christianity is something we do each and every day. It's not something you put on and take off. It is your life. Paul said this. I want you to view Christianity in this way. Look at how the Scripture teaches us to view ourselves. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, Paul says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? You were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, notice this, which are God's. I'm not my own. When I came out of the waters of baptism, life isn't about me anymore. I was bought with the high price of the blood of Jesus. Acts 20 verse 28, 1 Peter 2 verse 24. In view of that price that he paid and the commitment I made, my body and my spirit now belong to God. 
commit every day to live to Him. Galatians 2 verse 20, Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in this flesh, in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Realize that that old man was crucified. And the life you live, you now take up for Jesus every day. Paul viewed it this way. Paul said, I beg you, I urge you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Friend, have you decided more than anything to go to heaven? Have you committed to live for Jesus every day? That's what it means to stay saved. But then also you must realize that to stay saved, You've got to avoid sin at all costs. Oh, there's no doubt there's a passing pleasure to sin, Hebrews 11 verse 25. But friend, that pr pleasure is passing. It will not last and it will not satisfy your deepest need. Think about Joseph. Joseph was tempted to lie with Potiphar's wife, to have relations with her. She grabbed even his garment. He ran out of the house and left that in her hand. And he said, how can I do this wickedness, a sin against God? And Paul says... Flee youthful lust. That's the mentality we need to have at all costs. No matter if I have to leave the situation, whatever it may be, I need to flee it, run from it, don't have anything to do with it. And here's the reason why. The Bible says this in Proverbs 13, verse 15. The way of the transgressor is hard. You need to avoid sin at all costs because if you've got sin in your life, you know it, God knows it, your friends and neighbors know it, and you'll never be as faithful as you can as long as you remain in that sin. That means we need to avoid things like adultery and the, the lust of the flesh. First Peter 2 verse 11, Peter said, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. We need to avoid things like the speech we use, profanity and things of that nature. Ephesians 4 26, Paul said, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Colossians 3 verse 8, we're not to speak in an ungodly way and so at all cost in your life, do your best to avoid from sin even if you've got to run from it. Get away from it and here's the reason. If you get involved in it, Hear me well now. If you get involved in sin, it's going to cost you your eternal soul. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Revelation 21 verse 8 says all these people, the liars, the cowards, the immoral, they're going to burn in the lake of fire. Friend, if you get involved in sin, you can't stay saved. In fact, you will perish in the fires of hell and nobody wants you to do that. Now, another thing to keep us saved is that we've got to commit ourselves. If I'm going to stay saved, I've got to commit myself to serious Bible study. I'm not talking about reading the Bible every once in a while or opening the Bible when you go to Bible study or worship. You've got to be committed to Bible study in a serious daily way. Matthew 5 verse 6, here's the mentality Jesus had. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You've got to have a, an appetite, a, an unquenchable appetite for the Word of God. Psalmist said in Psalm 119, verses 10 through 12, Your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Oh, how men and women need the burning desire of Jeremiah. Jeremiah had been slapped in the face by an evil king. He'd been ridiculed for preaching God's Word, and he got depressed and discouraged. He said, you know what, I'm not going to preach about it anymore. But God's word was in his heart like a burning fire, shut up in his bones. He was weary of foreboding it and forbearing it, and he could not. Jeremiah had that burning, unquenchable fire caused by the word of God in his heart and how we need that today. The Bible says we're to study. That's a continual process. Study to show ourselves approved unto God. Peter said, be ready always to give an answer. 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. But today I want you to think about a an example of a scribe in the Old Testament. If there's a man in the Bible who was committed to serious study and the proclamation of God's Word, it was that great scribe Ezra. Look at what the Bible says concerning Ezra. What made him such a great man, a, a, a leader of true restoration among God's people? 
Notice Ezra 7 verse 10. The Bible says, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach its statutes and ordinances in all Israel. Ezra prepared his heart. What's that mean? He determined more than anything to go to heaven. He was committed to living for God and to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach its statutes and judgments in Israel. How we need people today who, if they are committed to staying saved, will seek regularly what God says about His will and His word for their life. Now, to stay saved, you also are going to have to be able to utilize the power of prayer in your fight against the devil. You know what's wonderful about me staying saved? God has not left me without tools in my arsenal that I can use to stay saved. God's given me things that will help me, like the Word of God, like prayer, like fellowship. God's given me things that will help me in my battle against the devil to stay saved. And one of those, the greatest one of those, I think, is the power of prayer in our fight against the devil. Listen to James 5, verse 16. The Bible says, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. You want to overcome sin? You want to win your battle against the devil? You want to stay saved? Then, my friend, make prayer a regular part of your life. Paul said, pray without ceasing. That's the idea, not that everything you do in life is a prayer, but there ought never to be a moment when you can't bow down and ask for God's help and plead before the throne of God for grace and mercy in times of need. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. I want you to think about what Jesus said. This is a passage that has always encouraged me concerning prayer and my fight to stay saved. Look at what Jesus said in Luke chapter 18, verse 1. It's a very simple statement. Jesus simply says that he spoke a parable to them that men ought to pray always and not lose heart. Do you ever get discouraged? Do you ever get down? Do you ever think, you know, sometimes I just want to throw in the towel? Or life gets so hard that I don't know that I can face it anymore. Jesus spoke a parable to him, and the parable was to teach them men ought to pray always and never lose heart. Friends, the power of prayer can encourage us to keep on keeping on when it's difficult to not give up. And here's why. Because we can approach the Creator of the universe who sent His Son to die for me, who loves me, and I know that He will hear my prayer if I'm living right and it's according to His will, and I know that He's willing to bless and to help me. Why do you think Jesus stayed as faithful as He did? Mark 1 verse 35 gives us some insight. Early in the morning, a great while before daylight, Jesus departed, went to a solitary place, and there prayed. Jesus began every day by asking God for His help and how we need to do the same thing today. Think about that great man, Daniel. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Daniel was told, the decree has been made at a certain time. You're going to bow down. Everybody is before this image, the image that's been made, or else there's going to be severe punishment. What did Daniel do? As was his custom from early days, Daniel opened his window and three times a day prayed toward Jerusalem. Daniel was in a good habit of praying to God regularly. And that's what encouraged, I believe, and helped Daniel. We need to cry unto God daily. Psalm 86 and verse 3. We need to ask for God's help. If it's possible, Jesus even realized the power of prayer. In Matthew 26, Jesus prayed to the Father, If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you want. Matthew 26 and 27. And so we must realize that if we're going to stay saved, we've got to use the tools God has given us. Now, to stay saved, we also must stay busy in the kingdom of God. People who get down and who fall by the wayside and things of that nature are those who often aren't busy in the kingdom of God. You know, if I'm busy and I'm working and I'm concerned about promoting God's will and living faithful and helping others in need and reaching the lost, it's going to be difficult for me to concentrate on the, the trials and tribulations in my life because I'm so busy trying to do the will of God. You know, the Christian ought to always be busy working in the kingdom. In John 9 verse 4, 
Jesus said, we need to work the works of him who sent us while it is day, for there's a time coming, night comes, when no man works. The point is, now's the opportunity. Let's be busy working in the kingdom. Revelation 14, verse 13, that great passage about the blessed, the dead in Christ who are blessed also says, they rest their labors and their works do follow them. Matthew 20 verse 1, Jesus likened the kingdom to a vineyard and all of us realize a vineyard is a place of work. We need to be busy working in the kingdom of God. But here's a passage I think that gives us a great insight about working in the kingdom of God and how that promotes faithfulness. Proverb writer said in Proverbs 16 verse 3, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Now you think about that for a moment. Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Where does sin begin? Does it not begin in the mind and in the lust and with usually evil thoughts? Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts can be established on godly things. That passage teaches us that if I'm busy doing what God wants me to, I'm going to be thinking about that and focusing on that and, and not get caught up with feeling sorry for myself or sin or temptation. It's going to be a lot harder. Would you notice what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58? Here's the encouragement he gives Christians. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. I need to be steadfast, working in the kingdom, and that's the labor that really matters in this life. Now, to stay saved, may we also realize that we're going to have to turn our trials into triumphs. As we have already suggested, the devil is doing everything possible to tempt, to try us, to cause us to sin. If we focus on those trials, if we uh, look at those and that's all we can see, those trials might cause us to fall by the wayside. But here's what you can do. You can turn those trials into triumphs. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces patience. James 1 verses 2 and 3. Blessed is the man who endures, for when he's been approved, he'll receive the crown of life. James chapter 1 and verse 12. And so there is a blessing, there's a joy in trials because they help make me a better person. I want you to look at a passage that I find to be very encouraging. Two passages in Psalm 119, verse 67 and verse 71. Notice how the psalmist realized the value of trials and faithfulness. Psalm 119, notice first of all, verse 67. The psalmist says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Now look at how verse 71 complements this. He says, It is good for me that I've been afflicted, that I may keep your statutes. He says, Before I was afflicted, I didn't keep your word. I went astray. It's good for me to be afflicted that I may keep your statutes. What did affliction and trial and persecution do for this person? It caused him to realize what really mattered in life. His affliction caused him to ask the question, what's life all about? Why am I here? And if there's so much trouble, how can I find the source of help? We need to realize the same is true for us today. We have got to turn our trials into triumphs. Even the most despairing trial, even if we're brought to the point of death, we need to realize that's not a bad thing. What is the best thing in this world that could happen to a faithful child of God? Here's the best thing, that he could die in faithfulness and go to heaven. Can you think of any greater thing than that? Someone... 15 says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Uh, in God's eyes, that's something beautiful. It's something that He admires. Uh, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. We need to realize it's not a bad thing. The trials we face, we can receive help in, and those can help us go to heaven. But realize this also. If we're going to stay saved, we've got to have a firm commitment and trust that God is going to help us in this life. God has not left me alone. He's not left me to fend for myself. I'm going to stay saved. I need to know there is a God in heaven who has promised me help, and He has not left me alone. Here's a passage that always offers encouragement to the child of God. Notice the words of Hebrews 13. I don't think you'll find a more encouraging passage about God's help than this. Look in verses 5 and 6 of Hebrews 13. The Bible says, Let your conduct... Be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Why? For he himself has said, I will never 
leave you nor forsake you, so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, what shall man do to me? That, that statement, God says, don't be covetous, you need to be content, here's the reason why. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You can say, the Lord is my helper. Friend, the God of heaven is going to help you through this life. He's going to offer encouragement through the Word of God. He's going to give us strength and, and provide for us through prayer. He gives us the fellowship of other Christians to encourage us, to exhort us to faithfulness. God's not going to leave us alone. Listen to the words of 1 Peter 5, verse 7. The Bible says, Cast all your cares on the Lord, and listen to this, he cares for you. You need to know today, friend, that God cares deeply for you and that He's not going to leave any of His children to fend for themselves in the battle for their soul and in a world of sin and evil. Remember what Jesus said, Matthew 28, verse 20, and Lo, I'm with you to the end of the age. Jesus offers us encouragement through His example, through the life that He lived, through the words that He spoke, and so let's have a firm trust in God's ability to help us in this life. Now, friend, we ask you this morning, if you're not a child of God, in view of all these things, why would you not want to become one? Look at all the things God's given us, everything we need to stay saved. If you're not a child of God, become one today. It's the best life you can ever live. What must a person do to be saved? The Bible teaches you first have to hear the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. Having heard that Word, realized it's the only authority for salvation, I then must be willing to believe Jesus is God's Son. When, when the Ethiopian eunuch asked, uh, hey, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. Acts chapter 8 verse 36 and 37. Once I've believed in Jesus, I must be willing to repent of sin. Peter preached, repent and turn again, Acts 3 and verse 19. Having stopped the sin in my life, I then must be willing to confess Jesus as the Son of God. Romans 10 verse 10 says, with the heart we believe unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And yes, I must. I must be willing to obey what God has to say concerning baptism. Here's what Jesus said. It's so simple, it's so plain. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe, he's going to be condemned. If you don't even believe, you're not a candidate to be baptized. But Jesus said if you do, there's something else you've got to do. You've got to be baptized to be saved. Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16, a multitude of passages teach that. But friend, if, you, if you're a child of God and maybe you've fallen by the wayside, our plea for you today is to get your life right. You can stay saved. You can overcome Satan. You can win the battle, but if you remain in sin, you will be lost. And so let's be encouraged today to be faithful unto death. I can stay saved. God's given me everything I need. And more than anything, let's make a commitment to go to heaven. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.